So the banks, when they get all this help, aren't required to help the people that are at the bottom of this pyramid, i.e. To, to, to help the mortgages, to um, even for their own benefit, even to, to stabilize that pyramid. Instead, they just basically receive loans and they receive bailouts and they receive uh, zero interest rates, which we still have. Um, and, and they receive um, something called quantitative easing, which I, I know we can, we can unpack, um, but, but they receive all this help and all of these subsidies, which, which go above and beyond um, any of what their individual losses would have been. So it's like, again, it's like you're taking that hundred bucks, you're losing it at the blackjack table and somebody's saying, you know what, David, we're just going to give you like a million dollars, you know, and just to pay off the hundred and just go nuts. And, and, and we're not going to tell you that you even have to give back that first hundred right. to like, you know, the person you borrowed it from, right. you, 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 whatever you do there is like your own thing. And, 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 and that's part of the problem. Good evening and welcome to your library. My name is David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library and host of Arc of History. Tonight's conversation is part of our Arc of History Repairing America series and presented in conjunction with the Kirstein Business Library and Innovation Center here at the library and our production partner at the GBH Forum Network. Tonight, I'm broadcasting live from the Central Library in Boston's Copley Square. Uh, no, that is not a virtual background behind me. I'm here in Bates Hall, the reading room. And uh, this is a place where visitors have pursued their research and study interests for over 125 years and will hopefully soon be able to do so in person once again. Tonight's bookstore partner is again Trident Bookstores and Cafe. Their information will be available on the screen and in the chat. And in addition, of course, for books by tonight's author, we encourage you to check out your local library in person or online. But before we get to tonight's special guest, here now is Gregor Smart, curator of the Kirstein Business Library and Innovation Center to introduce the center and its programs and services. Gregor, over to you. Thank you, David. And uh, I'd like to uh, also thank the Friends of Kirstein for sponsoring tonight's program. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Kirstein Business Library and Innovation Center, we've been around since 1930 as a resource uh, for the business community. We uh, offer services for creative people. We have support for job seekers. We support entrepreneurs and small businesses. We, we help you with uh, financial wellness. And with that, I will uh, send it back to David. Thank you. Thanks, Gregor. Some great programs and services on offer there. Uh, I should have taken a few before tonight's conversation to get ready, I think. Um, Repairing America provides us with an opportunity to engage with issues facing our country and to try to bend our arc of history a little more directly towards justice for all. It also gives us an opportunity to give voice to leaders, experts, and commentators, many of whom may not always have been afforded such opportunities in the past. Tonight, we are in conversation with Dr. Nomi Prinz, Dr. Prinz is an independent journalist, author of seven books, and is widely sought after for her unique perspective that crosses the divide between politics, finance, and the economy. To in, tonight, we will introduce her recent book, Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. Her last book, All the President's Bankers, explored the relationships between presidents and bankers over the past century and the impact on domestic and foreign policy. Her other acclaimed books include It Takes a Pillage, Other People's Money, which predicted the current financial crisis and was chosen as a best book of 2004 by several outlets, including The Economist. In addition, of course, Black Tuesday, a historical novel about the 1929 crash. Today's reality that we all face is governed by triple crises of COVID-19 as a public health emergency, the fiscal threat and economics collapse that we are on the verge of caused by the pandemic, and although primarily a US challenge, that of facing up to the issues of racial equity, many of which have their roots in economic classism of the 20th century, as well as a 400 year history and legacy of slavery. Now the American Rescue Act is uh, bringing help, but budgeted at $1.9 trillion, and discussion of an omnibus infrastructure bill revolves around a $3 trillion number. 
with figures that big, pretty much we're talking about real money, or are we? Dr. Prince, welcome to the program. Um, I was struck in reading the book by your citing in the introduction what got you started on the idea. Would you just tell us a little bit about uh, how that came to be and uh, set up our conversation for tonight? Um, certainly, David. And again, I just want to thank everyone out there um, in virtual Zoom land. Uh, and also uh, to the Boston Public Library, WGBH, um, the Kirstein Business Center as well for, for having me on tonight. Um, so there were, there were two things that got me into uh, the book Collusion. One was historical and related to libraries. <laughs> and I just want to bring that up first because I am a big fan um, and spend a lot of time, not now, but in general in libraries. Um, and one of the things that had happened that got me on the trajectory of all the president's bankers and then collusion was a jaunt through my uh, local public library in West Hollywood um, that was having F. Scott Fitzgerald month a number of years back. This was in 2012. And um, The Great Gatsby, of course, was the, the main uh, book that was uh, put up in posters around the library and around town, um, a lot of events around that. And of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in the Roaring Twenties period, um, which, which has now a century later, um, as it is um, very much relevance to today in the post-financial crisis period. Um, and his famous quote, let me tell you about the very rich, they're different from you and me, um, which actually came out a little bit after The Great Gatsby came out in The Rich Boys, but you can tell that his, his mindset was certainly considering inequality and, and sort of the, the assets and of course the stock market that was going on at the time. And then the more recent thing that came out of that historical novel that I wrote as a result of that trip to the library, which was Black Tuesday, was the bankers that were involved in the 1929 crash were legacy family, bloodline and namesakes of some of the most major banks that got bailed out and that existed until their bailout in the 2008 financial crisis from, from the Morgan Bank, JP Morgan Chase, now the largest bank in the United States and so forth. And because of that um, historical through line, um, I started looking at how the Fed, which was a part of that, and central banks um, played a role historically and, and, and most particularly um, in what I call collusion in, in the latest period with other central banks around the world in effectively helping to prop up uh, the financial community and financial markets under the narrative of propping up Main Street or the real economy. Um, and that was basically the, the, the impetus for collusion and, and also a visit that I had to the Federal Reserve where I addressed them, the World Bank and the IMF um, at one of their annual conferences about that very topic. Now, th this is a world that you came out of originally uh, from an earlier career um, stage. Um, wh what made you shift from being part of this world to a critic of this world, uh, given the, the, the works that you have produced? So um, generally, my, my moral compass, my soul, <laughs> uh, decided along the way that um, it, it was not uh, feeling it. Um, but what wound up happening throughout my career on Wall Street, and I, I started on Wall Street when I was 19 at Chase, um, down literally um, near Wall Street, near the New York Stock Exchange, um, as a mathy person, as a programmer out of school. Um, and, and at the time, it was, it was just very interesting. Um, you know, it was, it was the options, which were now more esoteric than they were then, were just starting, the, the banking, uh, just... Uh, just the environment was 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 interesting. It was kind of a new field. Um, from there, I went to Lehman Brothers, which of course went bankrupt later. And from there, I went to London uh, for Bear Stearns, where I uh, created and grew the analytics department. So I was always sort of on the number side. Um, but during that period, which was in the 90s, a lot of crises happened. There was the Asian crisis, the long-term capital management, big hedge fund crisis. Um, there was a, a lot of various Latin American and emerging market crises along the way, um, particularly during that period. And I started looking at um, the ways in which our bank and banks in general were helping to create this sort of debt around the world that countries were just unable to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how that really was devastating um, and growing to be more and more devastating at the expense of, of course, people in those countries, but, but also how, how much easier it was becoming for banks to, to do that. Um, so 1999, for example, I was in Birmingham in the UK um, at a demonstration called Jubilee 2000, which was to cancel 
all of the debt that effectively, yes, me and, 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 and banks have been involved in, in creating for different reasons over the years. Um, and so that was one turning point. Um, and still I was in there. Um, I was still at, at, in banking. And then I, I moved over to Goldman Sachs, um, where I was a managing director of two departments that specifically looked at different kinds of engineering of, of credit, of bets, of derivatives, of all the sort of things that ultimately were at the crux of the financial crisis and, and the subprime market crash. Um, and around that time, things started getting very much more out of whack. It wasn't like greed just showed up on Wall Street. Greed had been there forever. Um, but it was more the fact that the, the, um, the sleight of hand that was able to be created on the health of real companies, on, on the health of loans and so forth, um, had become incredibly intricate and incredibly dangerous. Um, and as I was contemplating that danger, um, Enron happened, right. WorldCom happened, a lot of scandals that were related to that kind of obfuscation of, of information mm. um, started happening. And then that culminated for me personally when 9-11 happened. Yeah. Um, when I was working right on Wall Street, right at Goldman Sachs that morning, um, saw the plane go literally around my office window. Um, and, and, then, and then, of course, the aftermath of that. And just that the feeling within that institution, within within Goldman, um, the idea that it's more important to continue to, to sort of trade, you know, as, as much as possible to last minute, even though at that time we didn't know exactly why the planes had hit. Right. But but there was a feeling that it was planes, therefore it was oil, therefore there were markets to be made, therefore, you know, stay at your desk um, as things were going down and, and in the weeks uh, to follow. And for me personally, all of that culminated in a sort of, you know, life's too short to deal with this stuff. Um, and, and also this need that I've, they've always had to explain. Um, and so rather than explaining just, you know, sort of the numbers as I was doing within Wall Street, um, and because I do have a math background right. and all of that, um, to, to explain in words and, and, and to a, a sort of larger community of people in, in, in general that weren't privy to um, all the esoteric stuff that was going on um, within the walls of Goldman and other Wall Street banks. And that's when I started writing articles and and from there came other people's money, my first book, and, and now we're here. And b before we get to like the recent history of 2008, 2009 through to today, um, I do want to um, pick up on something that you just uh, introduced, which was it wasn't always quite like this. Um, in yes, there was a stock market. Um, yes, there was trading. Yes, there was... Um, you know, highs and lows. Um, but you mentioned this, the introduction of a new way of dealing with stocks. It's a very quantitative way. Um, there are new um, vehicles introduced. You mentioned um, credit default swaps and all of the derivatives. Um, so, so what was it about the, why, what made those, what made that possible? Why, why suddenly these new, um, more quantitative-based tools? And that's even before we get to uh, the algorithmic artificial intelligence approach, which just um, accelerates that entire uh, cycle. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's an awesome question. And, and there's, there's the historical answer, and then there's a sort of um, engineering uh, on Wall Street answer yeah. to that. So I'll just try to combine them. And, and the historical um, derivation of why things got more unmoored um, within the Wall Street community, you know, beyond what had been going on, say, into the 1929 crash and the Great mm -hmm. Depression in the 30s and so forth, and why that occurred, um, was that two things. One, there was a period of time um, in the in the post-war, um, post-World War II now, in environment where, where bankers um, actually were, were afraid and also were more committed to the health of the real economy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know we can't really see that right now, but if you're living in history back then, they sort of caused um, this crash. They, they, they got slapped. They, they got regulated by um, a 1933 act called the Glass-Steagall Act. And they mm -hmm. also got some backing for people's deposits that had been so suffering in the 29 crash, which was the FDIC. Um, which is Federal Deposit Insurance Corp, which, which till this day basically insures our um, deposits at these banks. In return for that, they, they were regulated. And for decades, um, in the process of the war, in the process of the rebuilding of, of the country after the war, um, and really into the 60s and early part of the 70s, they, they continued to still do what they did but be a bit more regulated than they were before the 30s and also um, sort of 
care or help or something, the Main Street environment a bit more so and have more connection to the federal government as a result of that. Um, however, when a number of things started happening, um, the, the gold standard was, was taken away um, um, in, in the early 70s. Um, and, and that was um, historically because uh, of a lot of reasons, but one of them was that the bankers actually wanted it because the bankers wanted the Federal Reserve, which had been created in 1913 before World War I was there, et cetera, through these decades, um, couldn't necessarily be involved in helping uh, produce money for the banks. Um, then it was not as electronic as it is now, but, but, but nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, you take all the way, so you take this sort of idea of, of some balance away from just the creation of money. And, and bankers actually wanted that um, because it allowed them to take more risks the other thing that happened at the same time in the 70s was something called, um, well, the evolution of petrodollars, which is that there was a lot of oil money that was coming out of the Middle East. The bankers were incredibly interested in that money because they could turn it into loans to Latin America. So the Middle East couldn't really do anything with their own profits for, for various reasons. The bankers, particularly Chase, um, National City Bank, which became Citibank, which is now Citigroup, um, were all involved in trying to take those profits and and basically make money by lending them out and getting the interest and so forth. That made them a bit more unmoored from the government. They didn't have, you know, they had, they had the Fed kind of protecting them. They, or, or the, it was easier for the Fed, they knew to protect them, even though there hadn't been a crisis to the extent the Fed was needed as recently. And they also had more money coming in from another source. And so over the next decades from that, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, um, they got more um, interested in just doing their own thing and not sort of worrying about Main Street or regulations, started lobbying against regulations. There was a continued revolving door between the CEOs and executives at Wall Street banks and the White House and Treasury Department and lobbyists and so mm -hmm. forth. And they started hacking and hacking away at regulations. Right. As a result of that, by the time we got to 1999, when the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed um, under the Clinton administration and by a bipartisan in Congress by, by, by a 90 to 9, um, to 9 vote. Effectively, banks at that point um, could take money, could take loans, could recreate them in multiple different ways, could also um, get fees for investing people's money, investing corporate money, and, and basically a whole, and, and insuring it, and a whole host of other things. As a result of that, the the initial elements of the subprime crisis were built, which was credit derivatives. Well, if you can do a lot of stuff, there's risk. If there's risk, people can bet on that risk, just like you bet on a ball game, just like you bet on like, you know, at a casino, on blackjack, whatever, um, you're, you're taking risks. So the banks were said, they saying was, you know, if, if, if there's more risk to be taken, um, let's find new tools um, to not manage the risk, but to, to, to recreate it in different ways so we could sell off different pieces of risk. That's how um, credit default swaps were born um, in, and used in the 90s and grew. Right. That's how those bets actually happened. There was there was reason and and motive. Right. And so uh, you, you, we we then get value, and I'll put value in quotes, becoming decoupled from uh, the real economy, as you mentioned, um, and earlier ties to either the gold standard or to oil for a period of time, uh, which in turn, you know, is, although speculative at times, is still tied to some real trade or real value, even if it's predictive value. Um, you couple that with, with deregulation, um, and uh, you get our version of a free-for-all beginning to, 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 to build. Um, and so let's add in the engineering answer to the question, which is about, I believe, the technology, what the technology makes possible, uh, if you would. Yeah, so, so just the, the sheer math behind a derivative, and I, I, I will not get into the calculus, but, 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 but there is calculus behind it. Um, yeah. and, and, and what it boils down to is um, when you quantify any kind of an option, which is really a bet. There's complex and there's easy ones. Yeah. A credit default swap is, is a bet that credit will default. So you know, somewhere in there, the words somewhat relate to the thing. Um, but, but the math behind them needs um, effectively something stronger than a spreadsheet, um, which was how originally options were modeled. Um, and as computer technology got stronger and stronger and faster and faster, more and more types of options and combinations of options and 
um, the comparison of those options to, to mortgage loans or corporate loans or whatever on the other side got faster and easier and faster and easier. And as a result of that data yeah. being easier and quicker to process, you could come up with, as, as happened, more and more different ways of slicing and dicing it, of creating even more complex securities, options, combinations of them, mm -hmm. on and on and on, and, and computing them more and more quickly. Um, and so, so there was that combination of wanting to do it, having the ability to do it, and then having the technology um, to do it more and more quickly. When I started in banking, sorry, oh, um, I was I was actually um, so this this is the states me but whatever. Um, there were um, computer printouts um, which were you know green and blue kind of computer printouts where 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 there was like lines and lines of figures and it was my job when I first started to like basically calculate whether the figures on these new computer systems actually matched reality um, for how interest rates were moving relative to stock markets or deposit um, interest rate or, or whatever it might be. And, and that was like a by hand and by computer thing. And of course, that got faster and faster um, over the years. And that doesn't happen anymore. It's now all computerized. So, so at basis, we're saying that it's, it's really a sophisticated bet. Um, but if I make a bet, if I may buy a lottery ticket or uh, do whatever, and I lose, then I lose. I don't, I don't, no one gives me my money back. Um, which doesn't necessarily seem to be what happens in this stock market analogy. And, uh, you know, I, I'm guessing this is where certain insurance measures within uh, the guarantees, if you will, the FDIC that you mentioned, or, um, or hedging against that loss where you're actually having a competing bet to uh, basically counteract uh, should you lose. Um, but, but shouldn't I have a penalty? Shouldn't I lose the money if I make a bet and it doesn't pay off? Well, yeah, so if you're like a human, that is exactly what happens. Um, and if you're a human that's not trading or creating a trade on the other side of your bet, yep. you know, that's what happens. Like when you walk into um, a casino and, and you sit down on blackjack and you put down a hundred bucks and like you, you lose the hand and you'd bet it all, you, you know, no one's like, <laughs> the dealer's not like, wait, wait a minute, you know what, here's another hundred bucks. I'll just like, you know, take it out of my pocket, you know, just try, it doesn't work that way, right? For, for a real person. And also um, a real person, um, i.e. not a bank, um, can, can or a hedge fund can, can effectively um, not borrow the same, to the same extent and, and, and to nowadays at, at the very same cheap levels in order to continue to, to make that next bet. If, they, if someone loses a hundred bucks, they lose a hundred bucks. If a bank loses like a hundred million bucks or, you know, or, or more, then, 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 it's, then it's, well, if we lose all of this money, then um, you know, ATMs are gonna crash or, or more than that. And, and we're not gonna be able to function. If we can't function, the economy can't function, economy can't function. Um, now all those people that lost money because of what we did lose even more, or that's the narrative. Um, and, and so help us, which is where, um, you know, we, we talk about bailouts, we talk about the Federal Reserve currently kind of subsidizing those, those bets. And so um, when we also look at the general um, inequality that comes from this, you know, even individuals who have a component of participation in the stock market, and it's a limited percentage of people anyway, mm -hmm. um, if they bet and they lose, they, they lose. Um, if, if banks bet and lose, they get more money and then they buy back their own shares and, and pay off their, their, their executives. And so it's, it's a completely different, you know, it's a totally different um, playing field. It's, it's not like it's a rigged playing field, which it is. It's like you're, you're into completely different playing fields. So um, let's maybe start to talk a little bit about uh, the ingredients of collusion itself. Um, so again, in, in 2008, 2009, uh, 2009 at this point, um, I, I vividly remember images of, I, I believe it was the, the heads of certain banks going with Tim Geithner, and, who was the tre Treasury Secretary at the time, and Ben Bernanke was involved, and um, them essentially begging Congress to make certain allowances to do this bailout. So in your words, as a, someone who comes from this industry, would, would you describe for us what was happening there? Yeah, so I mean, they were scamming basically um, the public is what generally happened there. But what happened with respect to Tim Geithner um, was that he was head of, of one of the 12 branches of the Federal Reserve, the New York Fed, which yeah. was the one that was closest to Wall Street when a number of these Wall Street banks that ultimately got bailout and continued to get subsidized um, were 
betting on, at that time, subprime mortgages. Now, how do you do that? You basically either issue them, i.e. You, you lend actual individuals subprime mortgages, mortgages at, at, at really egregious rates, and, and there's a lot of fraud in that, but that's not even the main point. And then you also can buy entire portfolios because you're a bank, you have all this liquidity, what they, you know, what, what's considered basically capital to be able to do this. Um, and you also have your deposits insured. So at this point, your risk to, um, to communicate to the public is, is supposedly limited, or at least for the public is limited. Um, and so then you can buy and sell portfolios of these subprime loans. Then you can slice and dice them. Then you can resell them with, you know, throwing on a credit derivative or mixing and matching, and then you sell them out to the world. But all of the pieces of things you're creating, these banks are creating are, are contingent on two things. One is they have the money. And two is um, they have the regulatory structure to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism through which all of that happened was that if you just can imagine an, an upside down pyramid where the bottom is one little subprime loan, just like one. And, and you can just see how not stable that actually is. If anything happens to that one subprime loan, you, you, you topple the whole upside down pyramid. However, what Wall Street did in the years preceding the financial crisis is they kept saying, all right, little subprime loan, that, that interest that, that some person in Stockton, California is like paying you, we're going to we're going to use that interest and all the other people's interests and we're going to we're going to add it to the next set of securities we create and the next set of derivatives we create and the next set and so on and so on so this little loan is being relied upon for all this stuff it can't possibly it doesn't even make sense to do because of engineering of, of how finance works but all, and can still happen but also because if it goes away if someone defaults on it that whole pyramid crashes and so what was happening was, A, this was allowed to happen, and the environment was there for it to happen, and, and Tim Geithner was there for it to happen, and, you know, side seat, uh, you know, right there. Um, and also, once it did happen, the banks were like, well, wait a minute, you know, now all of this other stuff that we do is going to basically be at risk for the public if you don't help us out. So that's how ultimately um, they got together. It didn't hurt that Jamie Dimon, who was the CEO of Chase, was actually a Class A director at the of New York Fed. So it's like he had a kind of front seat there and all of that um, to, to basically say we, we need help. And if we don't get help, um, all of the other stuff predicated on everything else that we do for all of the rest of the public and then the world is going to just you know fall apart. So the Fed comes in and says, all right, well, we'll help. Um, ultimately, and that's where you got all of the mechanisms and tools that, that happened in the wake of the financial crisis in the end of 2008, 2009. We'll make rates low so you can borrow money easily and, and not really have to pay interest on it, which no humans can do. Right. I mean, you know, th these you get all these extra benefits because you basically messed up a system right. that you have um, geared in your favor anyway. So, so really, if you think about it, messing that up is 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 pretty egregious aside from how bad it is because right. you effectively had everything in your you own the casino, you own the rules. You, you, you owned all the dealers and you still mess it up and you still need help. Right. Um, so, and so, that's what ultimately happened. But when someone messes up, even on a massive scale, and you go to help them out, it can be a friend who gets into trouble, it can be whatever analogy you want. Um, but usually, one of the uh, pieces of the deal that, that uh, yes, I'll bail you out, but I'm going to put some rules in place so that you can't do it again. I know you say you're not gonna do it again, but I'm gonna put some boundaries or rules in place that, 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 will not, um, that will not allow you to do that again. Sounds like that didn't happen. No, so, so it's like there was no strings attached. So first of all, there, there was a real depth towards the losses that, that were being incurred. There, were, there was multi-trillions of dollars worth of like a whole, there's $14 trillion worth of these toxic assets or, or things that were predicated at the very bottom level on some person, you know, not paying off their subprime loan, but really because of all the engineering on top of that and all the other trading that was going on on top of that to begin with into the financial crisis. And then there was something called leverage or borrowing, which, which hedge funds, which, which, um, which municipalities, which, which individuals um, at hedge funds and private equity funds did to buy pieces of these toxic securities. Where do they get the money? From the banks. So, so th there's all of this extra kind of cloud of just risk that's been created in addition to, to the actual losses that were created by their 
mechanism and, and the regulatory nature of it all. So the banks, when they get all this help, aren't required to help the people that are at the bottom of this pyramid, i.e. To, to, to help the mortgages, to um, even for their own benefit, even to, to stabilize that pyramid. Mm -hmm. Instead, they just basically receive loans and they receive bailouts and they receive uh, zero interest rates, which we still have. Um, and, and they receive um, something called quantitative easing, which I, I know we can, we can unpack, um, but, but they receive all this help and all of these subsidies, which, which go above and beyond um, any of what their individual losses would have been. So it's like, again, it's like you're taking that hundred bucks, you're losing it at the blackjack table and somebody's saying, you know what, David, we're just going to give you like a million dollars, you know, and just you pay off the hundred and just go nuts. And, 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 and we're not going to tell you that you even have to give back that first hundred right. to like, you know, the person you borrowed it from, right. you, 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 whatever you do there is like your own thing. And, 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 and that's part of the problem. There was this idea that banks would have to be stress tested later on. I mean, it, it, I say idea because it was written into legislation, but, but in reality, they were creating their own stress tests. And the idea of those were, if something bad happens again, do you have enough money capital to get by? Mm. Well, at that point, of course they did because they got it um, from the Federal Reserve, from the government and from this implicit idea that they wouldn't be really re-regulated. And they in fact were not. And th this will help inform where we are today in terms of what the Federal Reserve and the government are, are continuing to do, albeit now for, for really good reasons. Um, uh, and, and perhaps differently uh, where it's going in terms of, of 2000, uh, 2009, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. It's like, well, where is this money coming from? Where is this extra money coming from? And uh, it's really the question about who controls the currency who controls the amount of currency that can be in circulation and what is that based on? So the historical answer to that is, is right now, well, mid history, I'll say, I won't go back to the beginning of, of the Fed or currencies, but in, in um, the post-war World War II era, when um, a meeting, basically a conference happened in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, there was a yep. lot of countries involved, but predominantly in the, in the wake of World War II, or as it was coming to a close, there was this idea that there would be these, uh, that there would be a reserve currency, which, which would be the US dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, all of the um, developed countries that were sort of allies of the United States were sort of involved mm -hmm. in that process. A lot of their central banks, the banks that effectively have or create the money for their individual banking systems. That's the idea of a centralized bank, a central bank to help the money go out to the banking system. And from there it goes wherever. Um, we're, we're again all predicated on, on the dollar and as, as we still are um, in, in the world today. What the Fed um, does and, and has done in sort of a really amplified way um, more recently is, is they've effectively created um, more and more dollars electronically um, and as a result of creating, um, and this doesn't, didn't just happen, but just, just to summarize, it, it, as a result of creating more and more dollars, um, two things could happen. One is when you create too much of anything, it could decrease in value. However, if all of the other central banks are doing the same thing, and if there's other reasons why the thing that should decrease in, in value in some respects, like the dollar, um, is needed by other central banks to make their banking systems function, which is where I get into the term collusion right. um, in, 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 in my recent book, um, then, then there's a sense that there's a necessity to continue to produce and print something that doesn't really have a, a sort of hard asset or relationship behind it right. in order to ostensibly keep money flowing into the system by which it goes through the banks. Yeah. And, and that, that's sort of how, how it ultimately works. There's an electronic creation at the Fed um, it sort of goes into the, the ledgers, let's say, of the banks, and from there it goes on um, elsewhere. And it, more recently, um, it got used to buy securities from the bank. So it's like, here's some created, fabricated money. Um, you give us your you know, crappy mortgage-backed securities that don't have any value or have less value than, um, well, have less value than, than they, they, they would. Let's anymore. get them off your books, basically. Let's get them and, and here's some money. So, so then it's basically saying, and the same thing with treasury bonds. Now, treasury bonds have a certain other value because of other buyers or other sort of requirements for treasury bonds, which is the debt 
yeah. um, that effectively our government and other governments in, in their own ways borrow is from, from the future in return for um, paying the people that buy those bonds, effectively the lenders to right. the United States and other governments, a certain amount of interest. Um, to the extent that there's a lot of debt and low interest, you can continue this process to, to increase that debt more and more and more because you're not really paying um, any interest on it. The reason you're not paying either government any interest on it is because mm -hmm. the Fed has a uh, cut interest rates, which they can do uh, to zero, and also because they can buy some of that debt or create demand for that debt um, out of the market through the banking system. Um, and that also basically creates um, money into the system, but it doesn't necessarily go to um, the actual economy. At, 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 a, at a one level, this is all just happening. Um, it's all really accounting. Right. Um, and, and it ultimately goes first and foremost through the financial system to, to financial assets like the markets. Right. Um, and how and where and, and how much of it goes into the real economy um, is kind of like not measured. It's just, it's implicitly decided that this is happening, but there's no real accountability um, for that money to the Main Street economy. It's if the mainstream economy gets some in the process, it's a benefit. But there is no like A to B report about that. Um, let's maybe unpack this concept of inequality. Uh, and I think we have a couple of slides we can use to give a few visuals. Uh, but this is really um, trying to illustrate, I think, the correlation or negative correlation between what's happening with the top 0.1%, the stock market, and uh, the everyday person who's simply trying to make ends meet and maybe whose mortgage got bundled up in one of these earlier problems or, um, you know, or name your other favorite uh, financial um, challenge for, for everyone who's just, uh, just trying to get by. Yeah, so, so, so the danger of money going into the stock market, wherever it's sourced, like it, you know, it's created cheaply, the Fed goes to the banking system, whether they um, buy their own stock and therefore increase the value of their own shares and that creates a sort of upward effect on the stock market and so forth, that the reality is most people um, are not engaged in that. And so all of the times that say any president or any leader on any side of the left right continuum you know talks about the economy um yeah you know, a lot of times they're actually looking whether they say it or not at the level of the stock market some say it some don't but you know somewhere in that um there's that concept and why also stock markets on you know it's on tv a lot you know we, we, there's a lot more business channels talking mm -hmm. about the level of stocks whether it's in um you know the s p 500 shares or blue caps small caps whatever than um, you know, how people are doing. Yeah, those stories come out, but you know you don't have four 24 seven channels, for example, just in the United States that deal with it, right? So, so it's not a thing. But if you look at the, this chart, which is really um, great from the New York Times and consolidating um, all of this information recently, is that um, let's talk about the bottom part of, of um, just the, the American population because usually we talk about how very few people own so much of the stock market. Well, let's flip it for a sec, because that's also um, instructive here as to how many people get anything out of this whole uh, you know, Fed, Wall Street bailout kind of um, cheap money thing, is that the bottom 80%, which is a lot of people, um, of families in the United States only have some participation, not even direct stock ownership in 7% of equities. And, and that, that's like 80%, 7%. And that 7%, um, only of which only 3% is actual stocks, that could be in, in 401ks, that could be in, um, in pension funds, you know, for example, for state employees or federal employees or um, union employees or, or whatever. There's a lot of different ways there's participation, which is locked up. Right. So, so even when we say that 80% of people only own 7% of some participation in the stock market, even that's not real participation they can like cash out on and use. And so that's only about 3%. And even that you can't kind of cash out and use. Now, going back to F. Scott Fitzgerald, let me tell you about the very rich. They're very uh, different from you and me. Well, if, if you're at the other side of this um, continuum, you've got say the top 10% uh, of people, uh, families in just the United States um, and they own or have some contribution, uh, some participation of 84%. 
um, of the stock market. And a lot more of it is a lot more liquid, i.e. they can cash it out. So they have more, they therefore benefit more on the upside and they can, if they need it, can cash out. Whereas an actual you know, person at sort of the other level of, of most of the people in this country just, just, just can't do that and, and can't afford um, to do that. So why does inequality come from that? Well, if, if, if wealth is growing for a very small part of the population, let's say even through the stock market, which is um, which is where most of this 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 can be seen most directly, um, for a wealth perspective, you know they are gaining, and other people are not, and that creates a, a larger um, gap, i.e., I more inequality um, between the two, and then you sort of compound that with well of that money which is less and more unequal to most of the population in terms of what they have wealth-wise, they have direct bills to pay and, and direct rent to pay. And they don't necessarily have a participation in, in say, um, real estate or, or any other things that, that could have potential value um, from a wealth perspective. So, so every little motion of the stock market when it goes up or even when it doesn't, um, or even just by doing nothing, uh, creates larger wealth gap or more inequality here. And, and, and this phenomenon is not just the United States. This, this, this is a global phenomenon. It gets worse actually, um, if you add in all of the other stock markets and economies and families around the world. And this is a, a uh, you know, this is a snapshot in time on this graph, but if we charted the last 30 years or last hundred years, we would see that this gap is getting wider and wider and wider with fewer and fewer um, uh, proportion in the middle. Um, I believe that's correct. Um, and if we were to uh, put a, in the US, a uh, racial lens or even a gender lens uh, through this, we would see even greater disparity between um, those at the top and, and those uh, at the bottom as the slide describes it. Well, that's very true. And, and again, and this is just looking at the effect of a financial market that's theoretically publicly available, although, you know, you see how much of the public actually um, has some some piece of it. Um, obviously, wealth in general has a lot of different um, pieces to it. Mm -hmm. But but that's why it's very instructive to look at the stock market, because it's it's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. and, and in recent past, as so much money has been created so cheaply and has gone through the financial system. It's been used to effectively push up the stock market for different reasons, not the only thing, but just, just in, 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 a, in a way to capture how this all goes. Um, and, and it doesn't ever um, give back to the rest of the people that are not participating in it. And in fact, it just, again, it, it continues to, to make that gap widen and widen. And the two other real measures of wealth are um, personal property um, and um, any savings people might have, which the U.S. certainly has never had a great record on at the individual level. And so, uh, you know, just to recognize that those those would be the other two um, major measures of, of wealth. Um, let's contrast the 2008 bailout, which clearly went all to the banks and really didn't uh, do much for uh, everyday uh uh, you know, 90% of the population. Um, with what I've read about the $1.9 trillion America Rescue um, Plan, which is one analysis um, shows that all of that investment is going mostly to small businesses or individuals who have uh, on registry with the, um, with the IRS. So this is it true that this is a different approach in that it's at least in the first instance sending the money to where it is needed in the street? Whether it ends up staying there is, I think, a, a valid question. Um, so, so, so yes, this is different from what happened um, in the, the financial crisis part one, because um, at that point, there was no discussion even um, besides some moratoriums, but but in general, the the, the extreme nature of, of foreclosures, the the lack of, of of helping to refinance or or forgive a portion of um, of people's mortgages because that was considered you know somehow un American. However, mm -hmm. giving lots of money to, to banks that, that that had it was was not. But but that that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So in, in this scenario, though, um, yes, there has been more um, of a 
um, focus on, on people in terms of extending unemployment benefits, in terms of um, creating um, PPP loans, or basically smaller loans for smaller businesses who, who had to be shut down and subsidizing those through um, some of these packages. Um, in addition, some money that's gone to, to health-related um, elements of, of this pandemic crisis, whether that's in vaccine distribution or creation um, or, or, or testing or, or all of that, which, which this particular package also accelerates, um, the, the latest one, the 1.9 trillion one, and also some money into um, some of the cities and localities who, because um, a lot of small businesses or, or people in general are making as much money at the ground level, um, as, as we've discussed, people at the top level are okay, um, that that money or those, those those tax revenues aren't going into the local level um, area, and so this latest package also helps that as well. All, all of that is absolutely um, useful, and it's useful in in securing the very insecure position that people in this economy have have had added to their general economic position because of the restrictions and the closures of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, and in that way. Um, there has been uh, additional help relative to the last financial crisis for um, the real economy, for, for, for real people who, who really have um, had to close businesses, who've really lost jobs, who really had to you know, stay home and watch kids and, and, and you know, take, take a pay cut or, or, or take one job off the table um, in a family and so forth. And, and that has been a disproportionate, um, you mentioned before, in terms of inequality, um, gender-based, uh, race-based, and so forth, that, that has also had um, a proportional um, painful effect, the pandemic and these closures on, on, on these people. Now, now, there is one unfortunate element about that help, um, which is that people at the very, very bottom of, of the socioeconomic chain probably don't get any of this help. Um, and, and that's because they either don't have the, the technology to fill out the forms, to deal with sending them in, to figure them out, to have the time, might not have the bank account to receive um, some of those, um, the checks that went out under, under the first, um, the $2.3 trillion package last year and the $1.9 trillion package this year um, and so forth. So there's a, there's a disenfranchised group of people that actually isn't even on the ladder to get that help. But all of that together, yes, it's more than last time. However, if, if you put up, and I just, I think this was another slide that we had, the, um, looking at how just the stock market in um, the Federal Reserve assets versus um, the S&P 500 um, in some manner has reacted mm -hmm. to the totality of, of these packages being available, right. plus the added Federal Reserve help relative to last crisis. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is that, um, the, the actual appreciation in the market this time around is, is far greater relative to the amount of uh, help that the Federal Reserve has been giving to this process from its perspective than it was during the financial crisis period um, in 2008 and, and, and up until 2019, really. Right, right. Annie, if you could bring up the third slide, which uh, we, we've just been referring to, that'd be great. Because I think the stark contrast in these curves we might have to explain a little bit, but um, but it's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. So this 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 is like the second piece of the the, the puzzle for which the first piece was um, that inequality um, percentage uh, participation um, relationship that we were showing before. So what this is, and I'm I'm just gonna do a wonky thing um, in again summary form. Federal Reserve assets. This is basically what the Fed put bought through the creation of electronic money for which it has no cap. There, there is no law against the amount of money that the Federal Reserve can create and under the auspices of helping the real economy. So that's the summary here, Federal Reserve assets. So you'll see from the, um, through a process called quantitative easing, and that's just a needlessly like technical term to basically say, we create money and buy stuff with it. And that's the blue line on this chart, which goes up in the end of 2008 into 2009, and then That's jumps right. again at the end of 2019. That's right. So it's so so if you notice in the beginning, um, 2008 to sort of 2000 end of 2013, it, it kind of jumps in a couple different stages, yep. or you can look at it as a straight line, however you want to look at that. Um, and that's that's the Fed creating different ways um, or creating different programs under which it's doing the same thing, which is basically injecting electronic money into the market through buying stuff mm -hmm. from the banks. 
right. um, and it's different stuff in different amounts during all of those periods um, in the beginning, 2008 to end of 2013, but that, that's what's going on. Hmm. Um, that plateaued between 2014 and the middle and then dipped a little into the middle of 2019. Now, I don't have a chart here, but the reason I called my book Collusion hmm. was because it wasn't just the Federal Reserve doing this. Right. It was all of the major central banks, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, around the world who were doing this um, in a similar fashion, just creating different amounts of electronic money and buying different stuff. But so th this is just the US side. But what you can see, just one more second. Sorry, let's go back. <laughs> I want to ask a question about it as well before we I know, it's had spinning. Ahead. Um, so but what you can see is that in the middle of 2019, that kind of dipped down. And what that meant was that the Fed decided and, and announced that things were kind of okay um, in, in sort of late 2017, early 2018. And they wouldn't have to keep on buying or keeping the same amount of stuff mm. on their books. They didn't ask for the money back. Right. They didn't give the stuff back, mm. the bonds back. But, but they kind of stopped buying new ones. It kind of plateaued. They kept the level the same. Um, and it, to the extent where some of it actually just sold off. Um, and so in the, the middle of 2019, we had a dip from a $4.5 trillion amount of the height of quantitative easing by the Fed or buying stuff for electronically produced money. Mm. And um, it went down to 3.7 in the mm. summer of 2019. It then, if you notice, even before the pandemic, so at the uh, middle end of 2019, through the beginning of 2020, um, you see a the blue line go up a bit. So the Fed was already starting to help banks again for other reasons that we don't necessarily have to get into, but they needed some help. Um, and so they started buying a little bit more. However, even before the pandemic hit, there was the, the banks were noticing that stuff was slowing down, they're international things. Um, and so the Fed just started to buy some more um, do more quantitative easing. By the time the CARES package came out, um, the Fed was up to six, seven trillion dollars worth of stuff on their books in return for electronic mm. uh, money. Mm. But that's the blue line. But if, if you notice the red line, the red line, it's not the level of the stock market. What it is is something called, and this is the only real finance, this is the other finance lesson, um, it's something called PE or, or price relative to earnings. And the reason that's a really good indication of how the stock market behaves relative to what the Fed is doing or other markets and other central banks is that you can, is that it means that the price of a stock is, is appreciating and is going up more than its earnings in sort of a faster way. And, and usually that's because money is being dumped into it before that company or the total of 500 companies, say in the S&P 500 in this chart, actually produce earnings to reflect the money that's coming into their shares. And so that's what you see in, in the red line. And then by the time you get into 2020, you just see this massive increase in, in the size of the Fed's book, which is now about seven and a half trillion. That's almost double what it was at the height of the financial crisis. And you see the stark increase, the red line, um, in the price to earnings of the market. Right. Just, just one measure of it. So what, what, what a, I'm going to pretend to be a normal person and suggest that um, you know, what you would hope is if someone is making an intervention and you'd make the intervention to keep things stable, but not allow, in this case, a large uptick in what could be overvaluation. Because in that scenario, it's again the top 1%, the people who invest all in the stock market are the ones who are making profit on that. Um, so is that a fair analysis of what's, what's going on? And uh, is the argument that this is a necessary side effect of this kind of quantitative easing or, or could a more measured approach create a more balanced um, outcome with more of the rescue dollars going to people who actually need it? Yeah, so that's, a, that's really, that, that's a super interesting um, perspective and question because um, money, has its own kind of virus-like um, elements, right? So money likes to reproduce itself. And so to the extent that 
there is more money coming into the system. And you know, as we spoke about, it's going into banks, it's going into the people that already have it. It, it wants to be where it can reproduce itself mm. the most, the quickest. Mm. Um, and, it, and, and whatever's underlying that, whether it's how companies are doing or how the economy is doing, it's like a, it's like a buzz kill. It kind of slows it down, right? So one of the things that happened in the wake of the financial crisis and, and also in the wake of, of the closures due to the pandemic with all this money being created is that it, it, like, it had to go there. Mm. Um, and so that's not letting central banks off the hook for what they're doing. That's just, that's just suggesting they pay attention to what actually happens and not then wonder why inequality has become um, a bigger problem when there's no other way this was going to go down mm. in terms of what happened. Now, your question is, well, okay, what well, could we have done it differently? Um, yeah, we could have put constraints on um, the financial institutions to the extent they couldn't buy. Last year, they couldn't buy their stock back with some of this money. Now they can. But I mean, like actual constraints. Um, and, and, and so where it's not that you're necessarily, for example, forgiving um, pieces of a student loan that you have with the bank or pieces of a mortgage that you have, but actually some of this money actually covers those things, not for a grace period, but right. in general. Right. Um, and, and that would have the effect of creating more money still going through the banking system, if that's where, you know, that's currently the structure of, of the Federal Reserve and the banking system. But, but in a way that's more equal um, to what's going on in the real economy. Right. And so that's not what happens. And, and as a result, we, we, we see these, you know, we see these charts, we see these lines doing, you know, reflecting money, doing what money does. Um, I'm going to turn back to the book, and then we're going to go through the um, audience questions that have been coming in. Uh, because I think you do an amazing job of, of positioning what we've been talking about in terms of the U.S. economy in counterpoint to um, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Japan, um, China, and two little analyses of two separate chapters on Europe. Um, but the, 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 the China dimension here is interesting because it in particular is very much on um, the global uh, affairs agenda. It's clearly seen as both a a trade and econ economic strength issue between the US and China. But part of this tonight also has its roots in that 2008, 2009 period where uh, China was one of the largest purchasers of US treasuries and other, uh, other devices. So unpack that little connection for us, if you would. Um yeah, it's, it was really fascinating what happened in the, in the wake of the financial crisis, which is that China kind of had a new moment. Yeah. And, and, and that moment um, of it was already growing as an economic power. It was growing as, um, as a competitive superpower and so forth relative to the United States and outside the sort of G7 realm of, of you know, sort of post-World War II relationships. But it, but it wasn't quite as dynamic on talking about central bank policy. Hmm. And what wound up happening in, in, in the beginning um, months and, and first year at least, and sort of going on from there of the financial crisis period is that the People's Bank of China um, started really heavily criticizing the Fed policy of, of subsidizing this banking system hmm. through the creation of, of you know, cheap money and other forms of help. Um, that had just caused this financial crisis that had had a knock on effect around the world. Right. Um, and so they were like, well, you know, this isn't, this doesn't make sense, you know, for, for, for many reasons um, that were said over the next few years from the Central Bank of China and also from the Chinese government, which is that, you know, this money isn't going into the real economy. It's not going into infrastructure. It's going into speculation. So therefore it's creating bubbles um, and therefore it's, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that's going to hurt you know, they cared about themselves and, the, and their regional partners, but ultimately that was going to come back to bite everyone. Mm. Um, they didn't use that term probably, or maybe they didn't, I, but in Chinese, I don't know. But um, so, so, so that was what was going on. So, so on a series of, of very public, um, of a, a very sort of public speeches at, at, at multinational you know, leadership forums that mm. then got you know, put into the press and everything else, um, this is what the, the leader of the People's Bank of, of China, Zhou, Zhou Shuashuan, was doing. He was saying, look, this is a problem. And so then you had all of these other countries, the BRICS countries, um, you know, Southeast Asian countries, 
other countries in Latin America and South America come in and say, you know, this is going to really hurt us because we don't have the luxury of creating all this money and not worrying about real inflation on a real economy, which is going to create real unrest in the streets, which happened anyway. And so we, we need some alternative um, to the dollar, to this kind of central bank policy um, or something else. And China was in a position where not only were they saying that as, as the loudest voice, Mm. Um, they were actively also trying to get their currency to step up to the plate and be considered at least as one of the um, main reserve um, currencies officially um, by the IMF and in, in, in their mechanism um, and, and in other ways. And so in that respect, they kind of utilize um, this repositioning of central banks and of the Fed and, and, and the United States at the time as a way to say, look, we aren't doing that. You know, we are the alternative. And they sort of rode that. They also had their own forms of creating money from nothing. But what they did was they tended to use that money not in speculative assets, not in the stock market as much, mm. um, but in building infrastructure, in lending it to um, alliances in their regions and so forth, which helped solidify their, their position as a trading partner to mm. many other countries while the United States was dealing with its own crisis and not doing that. Right. And so it, it, it kind of rejiggered the world. Including a strong presence in Africa as well as in uh, right. con countries directly abutting uh, abutting China. Um, you mentioned inflation right in the middle of that, and we have one question from Denise on this topic that wants to understand better um, why governments and why the Fed. You know, what? what let me read the question. Um, my understanding is that governments actually like high inflation because it reduces their debt burden but inflation obviously hurts consumers most profoundly, even at a 2% target. Why is inflation targeted by the Fed at all? <laughs> that is a, a really excellent question. So the Fed has this thing called the dual mandate, mm -hmm. um, which is on paper, which is which is at, was in addition to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, it came about later. Um, and it basically says that the Fed has to balance um, full employment with reduced inflation and it sort of arbitrarily, literally arbitrarily came up with this 2% ban. And even today they talk about moving it and, and doing other things. But when they look at inflation, they're looking at a sort of general, um, you know, sort of bucket of lots of prices moving um, in a certain way. And if they don't move by more than 2%, then there isn't 2% uh, inflation. And, and the reality is in, in the wake of the financial crisis, um, the growth of the United States and the way they measure inflation, therefore, related to growth or related to GDP, mm. uh, gross domestic product, was very limited because we actually weren't growing that much as a nation. Mm. Our stock market was growing. But on average, every if we average all the years since the financial crisis, including the ups and downs, we have only grown by less than 2% on average per year anyway. So we weren't even hitting their target. What that allowed them to do by having a target is to keep creating money because they basically have this target that was meaningless. Um, so, so, however, real inflation um, has come into the to really to very difficult ways for the real economy, um, which is real prices, like the real increase in, in rent, the real increase in healthcare costs, the real increase in student loan costs because of the increase in college costs. You know, th th those sorts of things actually impact people who don't have this ability to just get money out of nowhere to pay for it. Um, one for one in their pockets. That has inflated. That is not what the Fed looks like, looks at. So therefore they can continue to produce money um, and pretend that inflation isn't happening for, for real prices like this that impact real people. Um, and therefore it kind of gives them more of a power to keep doing this. Why do they get to do it? Why do they, why do they get to do it? I think the better question is um, by looking at instruments that have nothing to do with real people's day-to-day -day life or at least less to do. Right. Um, with real people's everyday life is just because that was that's in the legislation. That's what you know, their position and, and congressional leadership um, had and, and, and continues to, to, to have decided. Yeah, it's really inflation linked to uh, the consumer market and the, the real things you can actually buy rather than uh, the price of uh, or the value in the economy as a whole. Um, speaking of the, the, this, the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, as, a, as a central bank, let me read Josh's question, and you may want to comment on some of the terms used here, uh, just so that we understand exactly um, uh, the best way to talk about this. It says, is the U.S. Federal Reserve the only central bank in the G7 that's privately owned? And um, for some definition of private, right? So. Um, and if not, uh, are, are there others? Because I think this gets to 
the collus the collusive collusive analysis that you do in the book in terms of well, mm -hmm. who are these bodies anyway that are yeah. um, that are controlling controlling currency? So again, that that's an that's an awesome question, Josh. Um, and yes, it is. Um, so so the Federal Reserve was created um, through ultimately through through an act of, of Congress and, and signed into law by President Wilson in December 1913. Um, but the membership, um, and I, I talk about this in my book, All the Presidents Bankers, that the membership quality um, of the Federal Reserve actually is um, sort of reflective of the membership quality um, of the wealthiest people in the country at the time who had a percentage ownership of Jekyll Island, which was a resort, um, well, it was an island with, with a resort on it off of the coast of, of Georgia, where the, the initial blueprint um, in 1910 was, was created and then rechanged and everything over three years for the Federal Reserve. And that was very much a, a situation where, where there was a sort of a participation of membership um, like a corporation and also in this in this uh, sort of community um, at the time. And, and, and there were um, their ownership percentage of the Federal Reserve came to reflect that the size of the banks that were members um, of the system. Hmm. And in 1941, actually, was the last year um, since the start of the Federal Reserve in 1913 through 1941, where um, they would actually report on which banks had the most shares in the Federal Reserve system. Hmm. And then, um, and I think it was the St. Louis Fed that was, because they, they, they tend to be great at data, um, but I do have this um, in my book, but um, they stopped that. Um, in World War II, I, I, I suppose, because the banks didn't want to necessarily be showing themselves to have that kind of membership because they needed the Fed, because they were involved in the war effort, they were, they were issuing war bonds and so forth, whatever the reasons were, um, that was the last report. But if you extrapolate that going forward, it's, it's really kind of simple. It's like the banks that are the biggest have the most clout um, mm -hmm. and own the most shares in the Federal Reserve. Technically, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be independent um, as a result of how it was constructed from what the government wants to do and technically from what Wall Street wants it to do. But if Wall Street is yeah, part of the membership body um, and has the access, let alone the ability to get help, obviously, um, that's not running it like an independent corporation. That's like running it like you know, a very, very rigged corporation, which, which helps who you would imagine um, it would help. Congress can make laws to, to change how the Fed acts or to require, let's say, audits from what the Fed does and, and, and reporting from the Fed. It just, it just chooses not to um, and has continued to choose not to. So even the sort of um, the mechanism in the United States that will allow for some sort of a, even regulation of the Fed um, just, just isn't there to be used. Which leads into Joanne's question, actually. Um, what are one or two specific things I should be asking my representatives in Congress to do to make the Fed's programs or actions more transparent and pushing back against the anti-regulatory um, posture? Um, so one thing the Fed has not done, and, and particularly in this quantitative easing period since, since 2008 through, through now, and at, at least for m multiple years from now, um, is, is, is be accountable to, to where the money has, has gone. To, to put up the chart I put up before, the Federal Reserve versus the S&P um, price earnings ratios, and just say, hey, wait a minute, there's a relationship here. Let's, let's go back and let's, let's connect the dots. Um, just to start, this is literally just to start the, the sort of train of transparency between the amount of money we create, where we you put it, i.e. when we buy the bonds we buy using that money and where that money goes. Mm. Now, it requires a little bit of coordination and some logistics to report on that, but there has just never been a requirement from the Fed to do that. And the Fed's never required itself to be accountable for that. The Fed's just like, here's some money. It's going to help the real economy. Mm. And yeah, okay, it helps markets too and, and some banks. Mm. But, but that, that's, not trans, that, that's not even knowing what its own self does, what, it, what, it, what is it? So, so that's number one, is, is, not, is, is an audit trail of where the money goes, which a normal person would have in their own budget. Mm -hmm. A regular person's like, I got paid this and I have these bills. So right. this money went to these, it's very simple to do if you wanted to do it. Right. Um, they don't, 
and no one's making them. So, so that, that would be the first step is let, let's deal with what we actually are doing in, 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 in reality. Um, and then the second thing would be to require, um, once you see that information, um, you know, restrictions on if money is needed to, to, to buy certain bonds for a specific purpose, that, that that money is actually used for that specific purpose. So you first find out where it's going in general and then specifically. And then if, if, the Fed, if we believe the Fed is there to stabilize the economy relative to helping the financial system and growing this inequality gap, um, then, then actually segment it out to do just that. Because right. if I go get a mortgage to buy a house or a condo, I'm not allowed to go use that money for something else. So That's right. why, why should there, why should rules like that not apply to, to everybody? Um, That's right. And um, then there's uh, some predictive questions that have come in about what next. And this kind of brings us back, I think, to the uh, part of the conclusion in, in the book. Um, uh, are we likely to see more bubbles? Um, what, how would you characterize uh, this? We saw the slides earlier. The, those those um, graphs are going up. Um, is this a moment of peril after we come through the next little stabilization period? So because there's, there's such a strong artificial like source of money going into the markets mm. through the financial system, through main corporations and so forth, um, it, it does, as I was talking before about money, it, do, it does have the ability to reproduce itself. There, so there is a certain pattern, which is the reason why these markets are, are continuing to go up. Of course, there's, there's bad days, there's, there's uncertainty, there's choppiness. Um, but, but in general, why, even when there's a financial crisis and even when there's an economic you know, mass closure situation because of a pandemic, this, this, this help from the central banks um, morphs into something bigger than the amount of that actual help because, because it's used and then it, it reproduces. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as a result, the bubble or the, or the level of financial assets of the stock market continues um, to go up and up until acted upon by another um, factor which causes another crisis or is another crisis that comes out of this very activity. So in the end of my book, um, somewhere in uh, the conclusion chapter in collusion, I, I, I talked about how we were in the middle of creating another bubble. Um, and and the, the book came out, the, the hardback came out in 2018, and then the uh, paperback came out in 2019. So it was just around that time where, um, you know, the Fed was going to restart its, its whole, let's go double down on QE again before the pandemic. But one of the things that I talked about was there was a, a, a possibility, a strong possibility that some other factor was going to come in because the banking system has not been changed because regulatory uh, nature of things has not been changed because the Fed is doing what it's doing and other central banks are following and economies aren't keeping up with markets because all of those things are effectively a financial bubble to begin with that it, it, it will take and and it will happen that there'll be something to come about which will upset that apple cart and and I, I talked about the possibility of, of you know an extra kind of event I talked about the, you know, which which turned out to be the pandemic, um, or a, a major default of multiple um, bonds from pot potentially emerging markets or, or sort of weaker countries. That when things get bad, money flows out of them faster, and they're they're less equipped um, to deal with it than the, than the more developed countries that have like the Fed and the ECB and so forth. Or even in Europe, there there's that unevenness between Southern European countries and poor European countries, um, that, that all that there was going to be a factor that was going to get in there um, and, and, and drop the market and drop the economy and, and sort of pop this, this bubble. Mm. So, so that happened, and now we're in another bubble. Mm. Now this bubble can continue, um, and, and at the moment, um, aside from the, the ups and downs that, that have happened since it started in, in the sort of March 2020 period and since, um, for, for, for a while, it, it can continue um, for years, really, as long as the Fed and other central banks, and they've committed at least till 2023 to, to maintain uh, zero negative interest rates, as well as quantitative easing um, as, as needed, um, continues to happen because the markets not only know it's there, they, they, they rely on it being there. Um, and that helps them come up until that next crisis. And at that point, yes, this current bubble will pop. And the problem is, 
that, that real people ultimately, even if they're not participating in the market on the upside, are unfortunately having to participate um, in the fallout on the downside. Mm. And, and that's why the higher we go, the, the harder that falls. Mm. Th there's one um, recent development that's uh, become more popular in the discourse on these matters. And it's, uh, it's the concept of the universal basic income, um, which is an, another way of potentially intervening in how wealth is currently distributed and trying to redress, as I understand it, some imbalances, but also providing a safety net to some extent. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have uh, any thoughts from a financial perspective on, on, on how that could fit in. Um, so obviously having more disposable income at the level where that disposable income is used to pay for basic needs and maybe a little bit more than that to save um, it is necessary to create a stronger foundation across the American economy, across the world. And, and from the standpoint of, of, of a universal income or, or a higher wage um, or higher, um, minimum. higher minimum wage, that, that, that would help with, with getting that money into the pockets of, of, of more people. That doesn't help change, um, unfortunately, that the level of inequality as long if, if the market and all of the sort of wealth that's been being created as a result of, of being in that game um, is, is increasing by more. So, so although it can, it can help um, the, the foundation, the, the sort of more harder um, hit areas of the economy and people that are struggling and so forth, and that's a positive thing because it allows them to contribute, their families to contribute and so far into their part of the economy and then moving that foundation up and strengthening the bottom and, and, and moving that bottom up so more people are involved. And that's a good thing. But, but as long as the stock market um, or other types of financial assets are um, are accelerating in their pace relative to what's going on there, there's a problem. I mean, the, the, the actual, uh, you know, one solution, which isn't really a solution, it's just sort of getting involved in the game in a different way is for everybody to actually officially have a part of this market, mm. um, which would mean ultimately that, you know, you're dividing the participation at the participation level, not at a tax level, because we right. know that there's a really disproportionate um, tax situation where, where a lot of companies don't pay any tax, where um, it's a lot easier to sort of shelter money um, right. and wealth for the more you have, the more accountants you have at the top end. So, so I mean, there's different ways to do that. But, 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 but yes, people do need to have more, to have a more secure um, economy, but, but that doesn't necessarily change that, that disequilibrium. Well, wasn't the traditional um, concept of a company pension, uh, which may have been invested, um, a way for the majority of workers to participate in, in the stock market um, uh, or a, a, a reworking of that model, um, if such a thing still existed, obviously with, uh, with the move away from that kind of employment and uh, that labor guaranteed approach to um, long-term retirement prospects. Uh, it's not there anymore uh, for most people. Uh, but it, that could have been a way to make that real. Um, yeah, it, it was. I mean, the, the, the main pensions that were um, created, um, and that was also when, when, when uh, unions labor was, was stronger, when, when the gap between CO pay and, and worker pay was, was like 30 times and not like 350 times. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that were happening when those pensions, those systems were being created. But yes, it was an idea of both keeping uh, as a benefit um, in the future money in order to keep workers with with a company i mean it was, it's not different from when ford first created cars back in the early 1900s and he was like i'm going to give everyone at my factory um a decent wage a good wage a wage that will allow them to buy one of my cars yeah. now there ford had lots of issues but but the idea of that was to say look if you have a certain level of money mm -hmm. um that i am paying you and you buy and you are able to afford my car then my car will get on the road more more people will see them I will make more money, Ford will make more money, you will have a car, and we will have, now there, there's, there's some flaws in that, but I mean, that was the idea, and then ultimately that was pensions. But that was also at a time where, where growth was pretty solid, you know, give or take some, some recessions, and the, and the level of the market actually kind of was moving relative to the level of that growth. And so people's pensions were growing um, at, at a level that was related to what they could afford in the economy. Um, now, um, if you look at the, the wealth that even stock participation has allowed the top part of the country and, and world to have, 
Right. It, what, it, what it does is it means that other things become more expensive, like buying a home, um, you know, like you know, basically going to university and so forth. It brings all those prices up, um, which, which weren't really the case when the whole pension structure was, was envisioned. So, so you're right, it, it, it was a way to sort of divide that out and have shares in the company and, and bind into that company. But yeah, that doesn't really exist anymore. Even now, pension funds uh, have, to, have to chase some of this stuff up. And the problem is when there is a crash, when there is a, a popping of, of a bubble and it happens on like a day or a month or a year when someone's retiring, all of a sudden they could have what they expect to get cut in half. Right, which is obviously the downside of that of that model uh, for certain. Um, just a couple of thoughts before we try and bring this to, to a close. Um, I'm not sure I shared with you. I grew up in Ireland, and we always had one eye on the bigger island next door. Um, uh, and you know, just just watching the UK over the last few years deal with this Brexit concept. Um, has been both frightening and uh, weirdly fascinating. Um, so I'm just wondering, in the context of your analysis of Europe in the book, do you have thoughts on um, how the why why is this a good move for the UK economy? So um, one of the reasons that that I talk about in in, in collusion that that Brexit even happened that that basically the majority, a, a small majority, but the majority of, of, of people that voted in the referendum to leave the EU happened to vote in that direction and to have Brexit happen was because of a very, um, well, for historical reasons, because there was there was always a piece of, of, of the UK um, that didn't want to be a part of Europe. So that's that was one thing. But, but the other thing was that um, the instability in the economies after the financial crisis, and particularly in Europe relative to the UK, um, created a sort of um, more sort of populist bend, nationalistic bend um, that was kind of um, to some extent more dormant, and then to other extent um, probably didn't even exist in some people, but they were looking at the fact that, okay, well, we're not in a great financial situation. We're not in a great economic situation. The last thing we need is for Europe to be telling us what to do if we're putting this into sort of plain uh, on the ground terms. Now, Europe might not have been the full reason that that, that economic experience was happening. Um, and what I talk about in the book was that because of all of this money that was created, because the Bank of England was also buying bonds, because the stock market in the UK was also rising relative to the real economy, and because people were disconnected to begin with, um, they were then disconnected from their government, they were disconnected from the position relative to Europe, and they wanted out um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a majority term. The, the problem is that the, the downside of that is all of the sort of trade agreements and everything else that, that did actually um, benefit the UK um, when, when Brexit was ultimately uh, negotiated through multiple um, deals that didn't happen um, and then ultimately happened is that, is that there, is a, there is an extent to which um, that community, that, that trade alliance um, could have been more beneficial um, if there hadn't also been this economic crisis that accompanied this financial crisis and the way in which the Bank of England and, and, and central banks dealt with it, which had the effect of hurting more people. Well, I think we'll see in the years to come um, what, what impacts that, that truly has. Um, I, I'm struck also that, uh, and this will be my final question, um, you know, early in the book, you have this list of cast of characters from this period that, uh, you know, covers some well-known names like Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner that we talked about, but also Christine Lagarde, Janet Yellen. Um, it's, it's National Women's History Month. I'm wondering if there's a, um, a character that you're particularly drawn to or that you particularly admire from, from this list of, uh, of people who are either in this collusive world or proximate to it. That's a really great question. And, and obviously most of those people in that um, directory are, are men. So, so the, um, the, the ability to choose a woman is, 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 is limited from that. Although, you know, I, I do talk about leaders like Angela Merkel and, and, and so forth in that as well. Yeah. Um, I, I actually came away, it's, it's a great question because I, I haven't really thought too deeply about it since I, I finished the book, but I came away with an appreciation actually for Christine Lagarde. Mm relative to other people in that book, because I thought she, um, in her role and, and during her role as, as, as head of the IMF, which was her last role, now she's head of the European Central Bank, 
um, I, I did feel like she tried to ba better balance um, what was happening to the emerging market countries and, and what was happening as a result of prevailing central bank policies um, like the Fed. I remember when I was uh, addressing um, the, the Fed IMF and, um, and World Bank annual conference they had in Washington, which got me to write that book, or at least you know, created the spark, um, she was speaking at, at, at a luncheon on, on the second day of that, and, and Janet Yellen had spoken. She was the head of the Fed at the time um, in the morning of the first day, which is when I also spoke about how Main Street was not being helped by Wall Street because you didn't make Wall Street help Main Street. And, uh, and she was really pointing out at the time the, the, the possibilities of really negative repercussions. And this is in 2015. So this is like years into this whole process of quantitative easing and, and, and all the Fed support and so forth. Um, for the, the emerging market countries. She was also instrumental um, in, in widening um, the currency uh, basket, the SDR, which is a special um, deposit sort of in, um, in basket, which is kind of like a, a set of currencies, which at that time was just um, the European, you know, basically the Euro, uh, the yen and, and, and the pound and the dollar to basically expand that to also include the, the Chinese rent. But the, but the idea of that expansion um, kind of opens it to even more currencies. And so a lot of things happened under her watch that I, I think were really uh, taking into account the risks of the time and the future risks of the time. Now that said, she's now head of the European Central Bank and their policy is very steeply um, more quantitative easing, more uh, bond buying, and, and, and more keeping rates zero to negative for, for you know, years to come. So she's, she's continued to adopt those policies, but, but I do think in her role at that time, um, she also opened up more countries to sort of the fold and, and examine more of the risks to them of not being in it. Well, um, thank you so much for ending on a note that shows us there are opportunities for more responsible uh, policies and, and leadership in terms of how we ma manage global finances, global wealth, global currency, global value. Um, Dr. Prince, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, it's an incredibly uh, detailed book. Um, I, I feel like we've crammed three hours of conversation into 90 minutes. Um, I, I, I hope it was enjoyable for you too. Um, thank you all for joining us wherever you are. Dr. Prince, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. To our guests, uh, wherever you are, please be safe, be well, and until next time, thank you. <laughs>